Welcome to the Small Group Leader Podcast, a podcast by small group leaders for small group leaders to be equipped and encouraged as they make disciples for Jesus. My name is Derek Lynn, and on this episode, we'll be sitting down with Belkis Lehman and talking to her about the importance and practices of striving for diversity in our small groups. Belkis serves as the Diversity Director for Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. She drives diversity by helping to create initiatives that equip staff and student leaders. She has spent almost 30 years discipling and reaching college students and has some great wisdom to share with us on diversity in discipleship. Hi, Belkis. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Awesome. Could you go ahead and start by telling us a little bit about your background and what are some of the things you do as diversity director for Chi Alpha? Well, I'm a Cuban girl from Miami, so I'm a walking stereotype. (laughs) Um, I moved to the U.S. when I was seven years old. My family had immigrated twice by that point. Uh, We immigrated from Cuba to Colombia and then from Colombia to the U.S. And, uh, you know, grew up in a pretty um, diverse environment, but, you know, most of the people I knew were Latins and especially Cuban. Uh, There's a lot of Cubans in Miami. And, um, you know, went to school there, went to college in Miami. And then uh, moved to Michigan when I was 22 to do an internship, spent 15 years in Michigan, nine years in Indiana, and one year back in Florida, and then I've been living in North Carolina for the last four years. And I've done a bunch of different things with Chi Alpha, been working with Chi Alpha full-time since 1991. Awesome. And uh, yeah, my job as a diversity director is pretty simple. It's to help our whole movement basically accurately represent Christ and his kingdom. That's how I, you know, kind of think about it. And uh, we do that by equipping our leaders, you know, kind of our student leaders and our our staff primarily, equipping our leaders to, you know, to do that, to accurately represent Christ and his kingdom, to build multi-ethnic ministries, to, uh, to live out, you know, what we're supposed to be as God's people. Secondly, I help mobilize ethnic minority missionaries So we just think and strategize, okay, what's keeping our staff from being the diverse group that God desires it to be? And then how can we, you know, problem solve those things and increase the diversity among our staff? And then thirdly, our our third kind of priority is in Chi Alpha Diversity is to be a catalyst to help reach more HBCUs. So these are historically black colleges and universities. And we just want Chi Alpha to be on every single one of them and other minority serving institutions. We haven't really uh, delved into that, but that's in our future. Got you. So I wanted to kind of first look at what is your definition or framework for kingdom diversity? Okay, well, that's a big question. So I'm going to answer it as as, uh, succinctly as I can, but it's a very important, it's the most important thing is if you have the right framework, if you have the right context, as a believer, then everything else will make sense. And if you don't, you can have all the right parts, but if you don't have it in the right context, it doesn't bring life. That's been my observation. So this is what I, how I describe it. The, the Bible is a, a, a play, let's say, in four acts. It's a story in four acts. Creation, rebellion, restoration, and consummation. If you take the kingdom of God as a theme for these four parts, you find that in creation is God's perfect kingdom, God's perfect rule. You know, there in the garden, Mm -hmm. God was perfectly in charge and Adam and Eve lived under that perfect kingdom. And as a result of that, they had perfect communion with God, perfect connection with each other, perfect confidence in themselves and perfect partnership in in being working with with God in the world. Mm In that context, they were stewards. You know, God made the garden and they took care of it. God made the animals and they named them. And all of these concepts are based in the image of God. So that's a really important thing that we talk about a lot is the image of God and all the things that flow out of that. Our identity, our value, and purpose all flow out of the image of God. So when Adam and Eve rejected God's authority in their lives and said, you know what, we don't really care what you have to say, we're going to do it our way. Uh, Really that act of saying we're going to eat from this tree was not just like, oh, that looks kind of interesting and yummy. It was saying we want to establish what right and wrong is for ourselves. 
And so when, when we come into that second act, which is rebellion, I use the word rebellion, not the fall of man, because they didn't trip and fall. They made a conscious choice to yeah. rebel. Um, they, we go from communion to isolation. They're no longer communion with God. They just find themselves alone. They go from connection to consumption. They, we went from human beings that relationship, we were created to be in connection with each other, to looking each, at each other as consumer items. I consume people for my own benefit, either for profit, for sexual pleasure, for emotional security. But people are there to as something for me. I, I, I consume them. I take them in. Uh, I, they go from confidence to insecurity. And boy, one of my observations in you know 30 years of ministry is everybody's insecure. Yeah. Okay, everybody. I don't care what position they have. I don't care if they're a rock star, literally, or you know, the person working at Walmart, every single person is insecure. And then from partnership to really self-centeredness of, hey, we're supposed to be God's partners in this world, but instead now we are looking at the world also as a consumer item. You know, these, I'm using the things of this world to bring me pleasure, or bring me profit. Um, so this is the state that causes divisions. This is the, the state of rebelling. We're still living in that. And, and we have divisions because we're insecure and so I feel the need to prop myself up by the pursuit of power, or wealth, or fame. And in this pursuit, we oppress and destroy each other, both individually and societally, because we see people as consumer items. And all the ills of the world find their root in the reality that we're now all really working hard to build our individual kingdoms. And when your little kingdom comes in conflict with my little kingdom, we have a problem. And that brings us to the third act, which is restoration. And this is the reason Jesus came into the world, to set things right, to take the world that was turned upside down and turn it right back up again. And this is, Jesus called this the kingdom of God, and this is what he announced. And when I say announce, we sometimes use the word preach. It's more like a herald saying, hey, everybody, hey, I have big news for you. You know, like the good news is news. It's not like information. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's news. It's like, hey, did you hear that, you know, the house in the neighborhood burned down? Hey, did you hear? It's news. It's a, an event has taken place that is newsworthy that we're talking yeah. about. And this is the event. God has come into the world to fix the world, to set it aright. And so this restoration, you know, brings us a return to communion, connection, confidence and partnership, because, you know, as Jesus defeats sin, death and the devil, through his life, death, and resurrection, then we have the ability to enter, you know, God's kingdom. And then that brings us to the fourth act, which is consummation. We're talking about the consummation of God's kingdom, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and, you know, God, you know, righting all wrongs. There shall be no more tears. This is all the stuff that it talks about in John's revelation that he sees and says, wow, this is what it's going to look like at the very end when God you know, his kingdom completely consumes the kingdoms of this world. So today we live in two kingdoms. God's kingdom is here, and the, but the kingdom of darkness, and they live right next to each other. But in the moment where one, where light swallows darkness, then we will live this life of what? Of complete communion with God, complete connection with each other. Uh, there's no war. You know, we are not, there's no ethnic divisions. Uh, we, you know, we were completely secure in who God is and in who we are. And so what does that mean? What do you say? Well, what does that have to do with kingdom diversity? Well, it has to do with this. The job of restored humanity, which is the church, the job of restored humanity is to manifest that kingdom today. Yeah. You know, the fancy uh, theological term is to say we're God's eschatological people. You have to look that up, you know, <laughs> yeah. God's eschatological people. We're God's people of the eschaton. We're God's people of the end. Sometimes we think eschatology has to do with like something that's going to happen in the end times. But the Jewish people believe the end in the Jewish people. And, and Paul believed that the end time started the day Jesus died and rose from the dead. That eschaton that they've been waiting for was there that, you know, because resurrection is of the eschaton. And, you know, these things, they're all of the eschaton. And so he's, what does he say to the Corinthians? He says, why are you suing each other? One day you're going to judge angels. Can't you figure this out now? Yeah. So he points to that 
the eschaton, he points to this is who God has created us to be. This is who God's restored us to be, the true humanity. And so because we're that, it should affect how we live today. Yeah. So if we're a, a kingdom of every nation, tribe, people, and language, that should affect how we live today. And so for us to live segregated segregated existence is to deny the kingdom we are a part of. And if you look at the New Testament model, especially the Acts model, that wasn't that's not what happened. The, the Acts model, the day the church was founded, it was founded as a multi-ethnic congregation. Yeah. And it just gets more diverse from then on. That's the standard. That's the norm. That's the way it should be because that exemplifies and lets people know this is who God is. This is what his kingdom is all about. So that's my framework. That's the reason we exist. We exist to manifest God's image through our lives individually and corporately. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are some of the barriers to diversity that we face at the small group level? So I, I'd like to point us back up to those four things I talked about that are the results of mm -hmm. rebellion, isolation, insecurity, consumption, and self-centeredness. Yeah. Our self-centeredness can make our small group about us. We can, you know, our motivations can be some kind of performance, you know, like, oh, I really want to have a good small group. I really want it to be successful. I want to have a lot of people here. You know, I want to show my director or my research group leader, whoever it is, or my other small group members that I'm, you know, I'm a successful small group leader. And so what do we do? We, we go after what's easy. And the easiest thing is for us to reach people just like yeah. us. You know, we have to die to that. We have to die to that desire for human success and the, you know, the, making it about us. Our small group should not be about us, obviously. Uh, our insecurity can keep us from pursuing those the father loves because we feel incapable of connecting with them. You know, fear is a great barrier in cross-cultural relationships. We just feel like, wow, I don't feel competent in this. And so let me not do it. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, on the whole consumer uh, consumption uh, line, uh, it's very easy to look at people as projects. And I think especially sometimes when we, we think about, okay, I'm going to go after this cross-cultural relationships. We can sometimes approach it as this person is a project. And we have to go back to that image of God and remember that this is this person, no matter if they, they're a total mess. I mean, they're, they're an addict. They're living in incredible, you know, sin. It doesn't matter. This person is God's sacred creation. Yeah. I mentioned that one time. Let me diverge here a little bit because I talk a lot about how everyone is sacred. And I had a student come up to me and say, how is that? How is that? Why? How can you say that? Because some people are living sinful lives. They're not holy. You know, and I said, we, we, we define holiness as behavior. And I think our holiness can be exemplified by our behavior. Yeah. But our, our sacredness is, has to do with who we are and what we were meant for and not the things we do. Yeah. As, as we discover that we are sacred beings, then we start living differently. But if we just change our behavior, that's called moralism, not Christianity. Yeah. And so we are to approach every person. And this is why racism is a sin, because it transgresses the value that God places on people. Mm, yeah. Um, so, so I think if we just grab a hold of that one biblical truth of, wow, this person sitting next to me, that person over there. You know, this person who's living a lifestyle that I completely disagree with them. They're so beautiful, sacred, and special to the Father. And, and we let that brokenness take a hold of our heart. Then we're going to avoid that pitfall of looking at this person as a project. Yeah. And, and then I think lastly, you know, we, we have to seek the Lord. We have to find his heart and his help. You know, I call it empowerment. You know, God mm -hmm. empowers us to do his work. And if we're not in communion with the Father and really, you know, refreshing that life and living that life of communion and seeking him, uh, then, you know, we're not going to have neither the desire nor the ability to, you know, go after those people, whatever they look like, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're not going to have that because we need, you know, this is, this is God's work. We can't do it on our own. Yeah. Man, that's good. So what advice or practical action steps would you give to a small group leader who is really wanting to start reaching out across all cultures and races? 
Well, I would say good, good for you. Number one, I would yeah. totally celebrate that. And I think, you know, um, for those who are listening to this, maybe some campus pastors who are listening to this, I think celebration is such a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we, when we talk about, when we stand up and say, Hey, so-and-so small group is doing great. What are we celebrating about that small group? And if we're celebrating a lot of homogeneous small groups, uh, we are saying to our whole ministry, that's what a good small group looks like. And so if we really have the value of our small groups need to look like God's kingdom and the family of God, then we should start celebrating the groups that are doing that in a very public way. Anyway, that's just a little you know thing about how do we change culture yeah. is celebration. Okay, but for this small group leader, I would say number one, you need to learn. You know, we're in a climate where ignorance is no longer an option. And there's a lot of resources out there. We're putting out a lot of resources on kaiafa.com. You can go to the kaiafa.com website and look under resources. Uh, we have a website, Kaiafa Diversity does. It's called drivingdiversity.org. And uh, you need to become a student of stuff. Because mm -hmm. if somebody goes to your small group and talks about George Floyd and why they're upset and you don't understand, you're, you're not prepared to build a relationship with that person. It's, you know, we're talking about cross-cultural relationships. That means I need to understand what's important. If you want to build a relationship with me as a Cuban gal, and you don't, you've never heard of Fidel Castro or what he did to our country or how many of us feel about it, uh, it's going to make me feel like, wow, you're not taking this very seriously. Yeah. You don't really care about me. There are things that affect my life. And so you have to, if it's really affected my life in a deep way, it's why we left our country and moved to two different countries, then, you know, find out about it so that, you know, it, it makes me feel valuable. And so you have to learn about this person's culture, whether they're a student from China or there's, you know, a person, an African-American student, an Asian-American, Asian-Americans are not the same as Asian international students. So taking the time to learn. There's a ton of information out there on the web. Some of it's good, some of it's horrible, but even the horrible one will still give you, you know, some, you know, frame of reference. Mm. So be a student. Don't freak yourself out on the learning like, oh, until I'm like a PhD in this person's culture, I can't <laughs> actually build a relationship with them. Uh, you know, put a little effort in there so that it shows a value. But, you know, also as you build relationship with people, you're going to learn a lot just from, you know, being with them. The second thing is just to pray. I, you know, prayer is the way we partner with God. It's the core way we partner with God. Uh, how can I say that? Well, it says now that Jesus' primary ministry is intercession. It says, you know, he's ever making intercession today. So if, if our vocation is to be God's partners and to be his image bearers, then we cannot partner with him without praying and pray for what you want. You know, if you want a diverse small group, pray for it, you know, say, father, bring these people to me, show me where they're at, show me how I can meet them. What's, what's wrong in my heart. That's going to be a hindrance, you know, show that here's my thing. I have been in a lot of small groups. I've been in a lot of Chi Alpha groups. And I see people are pretty open about talking about things. They say, you know, I had a problem with pornography. I, you know, I had a problem with lesbianism. I had a problem, you know what I mean? Any things that they've gone through, any struggles they've gone through in their lives. But if you bring up the R word, racism, nobody's ever had a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, really? Like you've never like found prejudice in your own heart or bias or anything? Yeah. Um, gosh, that happens to me all the time. You know, I find myself all the time in situations where, I, you know, something comes out of my heart and I'm like, oh, dang, that's ugly. And I have to repent in that moment and ask the Lord to change my heart, whether it's being on a campus late at night and seeing a, you know, a black man walking across and feeling fearful and then having to have the conversation with myself. This is just some student walking to his dorm and, yeah. you know, I'm not in any danger here, you know, and, and going out of my way to say hello to him. So I have to have that conversation with myself. And I wish I could tell you, I did that 10 years ago and I've never had a problem since. Okay. You know, we're, we're socialized. We're taught by our society to feel certain ways about things. So I think we have to pray things out of our hearts. And if we're not honest about it, it's still going to be there. So, you know, yeah. learn, pray. And then the last thing I would just say is go. Crossing cultures involves action, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, you know, there's a whole, like we welcome everyone attitude, which is great. But uh, welcoming people isn't going to change your small group. It's not like, oh, I'll never, I won't turn a person away if they come here. Well, they're not coming. <laughs>
go, go, you know, you have to cross culture. You have to go from where you're at to where they're at. You know, this is what Jesus did. Yeah. He came from where he lived, God's domain into our world. He, you know, the flesh, God became flesh. And, you know, Jesus came and he lived. You know, sometimes we talk just about Jesus dying, but mm-hmm. Jesus lived and he, he sought out people. He came into this world. He went after them and not in a creepy way. You know what I mean? Uh, Cause sometimes people can be a little creepy. So just, you know, <laughs> going to where people are and being there, the power of presence. Uh, one of our, our diversity task force members talked about that the other day. Uh, just being there repeatedly, you know, going to the black student union and hanging out there a lot. And it's, yeah. yes, it's uncomfortable. You know, Jesus did this. He went and hung out by a well in Samaria at a really stupid time of the day because he thought there's somebody there I want to meet. And when this person got there, they were not receptive to him. They didn't say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for coming. I'm so, so awesome of you. They were like, what are you doing here? And you shouldn't be here. And why are you even talking to me? And, you know, I think we have to, we have to cross a culture, go to the places and, and then see what happens. I wanted to ask this. What can a small group leader do outside of their small group to help create a world more inclusive of all ethnicities and all cultures? I think be the person who's constantly crossing culture. You know, if we live out the kingdom ethic, if we, I think the kingdom ethic is this, it's redefining normal all the time. Yeah. Uh, We have a class and it goes through 10 qualities of a kingdom ambassador. That's how we framed it. We're, We're the ambassadors of God's kingdom. What are the qualities we need as that ambassador? And you can take the class and then you'll know what those are. Uh, But the crux of those is this, we're redefining normal. As we live our lives differently, as we're part of God's new creation, you know, we are a new creation ourselves, but also God is, is bringing, he's changing the world into his image and he's making it, we're part of it, the new creation. This like people of yeah. the eschaton, this stuff that we talked about. As we, do, as we do that, we're redefining what normal is. So normal is I cross culture. Normal is I am humble. Normal is I pursue people. Normal is I practice hospitality. Normal is I'm other centered. So if you go to class, sit by the person who looks differently than you. Be the first person to talk to them. Be the first person to say, hey, you want to be in my study group. You know, if you have the 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 not so great job on campus working at Wendy's or Mickey D's, you know, and you're like hospitable and kind and generous to your customers. I'll tell you one of the places that I see, I, I see the manifestation of systemic racism on our campuses is the majority of our students are white, but all the people behind the counter are black. Mm. If you go, you know, Wake Forest is a place that it's like screaming at you. Every person working at every food service thing and the janitors, et cetera, they're all black. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's the, the our, our inheritance of you know, of racial injustice. And how do I treat that person behind the counter? As a student, how do you treat that person? Do you know their name? You know, are you kind to them? I think that we have so much power. Jesus showed us this way of living that is so powerful. And it is living, you know, treating people as this valuable, incredible, sacred, you know, human beings. And living that at Kingdom Ethic, we, you know, study the Sermon on the Mount and what it says there about how do we treat our, even our enemies, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think there's so many things we can do in our everyday lives. Uh, another little thing that I do is I, I, um, I use minority-owned businesses. That may sound, you know, silly, but, you know, uh, we, did, we were doing this way back, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, just saying, hey, there's two Christian bookstores in town. One of them is a black owned store. The other one is a white owned store. We just shopped at the black owned store. You know, mm-hmm. we thought maybe a lot, not a lot of people are doing that. Mostly black people shopped. I really hardly ever saw any white people there uh, besides us. But we just made the conscious choice of if we really believe in systematic change, then I have to put my money where it can, you know, lift somebody up out of their situation that they have inherited. Mm-hmm. So I think you can create a world that, you know, may not be dramatically different, but you can, you can make your change. And I think the other thing I would say is be a bridge builder. If you're listening to this podcast and you're like, man, I'm like 100% with you, Belkis. Then two things I would say, one is be an advocate. So other people in your ministry, maybe are going to get it right away. Don't, 
take an attitude because remember we said humility is powerful. Don't become yeah. arrogant and I get it and you don't, or I'm woke and you're asleep. You know, please, that's not God's kingdom. That may be the things of this world, but that's not the kingdom of God. We don't differentiate ourselves as the woke and asleep crowd. We, if we see our brother in error, we bring, we take their hand and try to pull them out. We don't yell at them, cancel them, or tell them they're an idiot. Okay, so we, you know, so one is we we love people into truth. Uh, we can be an advocate for things like within your ministry, within you know your your where you have your sphere of influence of saying, hey, let's make these changes, let's do these things so that we can be a more welcoming environment, and that we're also going out, and then being a bridge builder. If you're feeling like, man, I'm I'm really comfortable in these cross cultural spaces, well, don't just live there yourself and say, hey, well, I'm the person who has all the Chinese friends. I think sometimes we can identify ourselves as like, I'm the cool guy with all the Chinese friends. Well, are you helping other people make Chinese friends? <laughs> you know, I'm like the, 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 the black guy who's got all the Latin friends. Well, are you helping other people make Latin friends? So don't just live there and, and kind of like feel great about yourself. Help other people to do that as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So what are some resources that would be good to recommend for someone looking to learn more about this. Okay, so the number one resource is you need to read your Bible, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, everywhere I go, I ask this question. How many of you read through the Bible? And I would say in every Chi Alpha group I've ever asked that question, only a handful of hands go up, like two or three, not even 10% or 5%. We're talking a very small percentage. So you cannot be an ambassador of God's kingdom if you don't even know what that's all about. Uh, it's my minimum that every believer should read through the Bible every year. It, it is not weird. It's not weird. It's not like crazy spook or spiritual people do that. That's really just a pretty simple thing to do. And there's a thousand Bible apps out there to help you. So I would say, be a student of God's word. Read through it every year. The first five times you're going to like be like, I don't know what the, you know this is talking about. But six, seven, eight, nine is so really making a lot of sense. That's People will be like, that's crazy. But you know what? You have to yeah. get familiar with it to get better. So I would say number one, yeah. You need to be a student in God's word and obviously a person of prayer. That's those two things are, you know, you, you want God's heart and God's help. You have to do it that way. Uh, that, then on the side of like other resources, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources that we're pointing right now because it's all very in our minds on chiAlpha.com. Uh, resources are constantly being added. So go there, go through the resources, take our class that you can find that on that resource page. Uh, it's called Kingdom Diversity and, you know, becoming an ambassador of the upside down kingdom. It's teaching you to look at the world differently and live your life differently. And if you do that, you'll get different results. And then mm -hmm. also we have a website, uh, Chi Alpha Diversity. I, you know, you can say I have a website. It's called drivingdiversity.org. Uh, there's lots of blogs there. There's other information. There's a resource page there as well. And, uh, you know, we're, we put blogs on a regular basis. And it just kind of keep you updated on, you know, what's going on. Awesome. So when you look five, 10, 50 years into the future, what do you hope to see both in small groups and the kingdom of God when it comes to diversity? Okay, let me frame it this way, because I think it's important. Jesus told this parable of the wheat and the tares, and he said that they both grow together. We're living in a time of two kingdoms. Uh, there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. They both live side by side. Until Jesus puts his feet on this earth, the kingdom of darkness is not going to be annihilated. That means that ills in our society, evil in human hearts, uh, those things are not just going to disappear. Sometimes when I, when I speak, somebody says, well, don't you think things are just going to get better? They're kind of futurist. You know, there's people that the traditionalists, they think, you know, if we look back, the world was better. Yes, if it was, you know, the world 50 years ago was better if you were, you know, a white middle class person, uh, but not, for really any, <laughs> not really for anybody else. Yeah. So the traditionalist crowd, yeah. you know, wants it to be like it used to be because, you know, it was better. The futurist crowd thinks if we just keep living, things will get better. Well, it doesn't really do that. The, the, the better that we have now, people fought and died for. OK, yeah. it didn't just happen because the time passed, because the calendar passed, you know. So I think my my goal in life is to see the people of God live like it. 
if God's people yeah. actually live like God's people, really act like God's people, it actually can transform our society. It has happened before. Uh, but we can't make our goal to transform society because we probably will accomplish nothing. We have to, mm. number one, be authentic to who we're supposed to be. I think that's the most thing. So what I would like to see in 50 years is that in, in, the, in the churches all around the world, wherever that is pertinent and applicable, that diversity, kingdom diversity is the norm. And when I say kingdom diversity, I don't mean just that there's diversity in the congregation or even just diversity in the congregation and the leadership, but that there's, you know, that the experience is, a, is one of family where our cultures are all being experienced and that the strength of our cultures, as far as who God is, we all bring different things to the table culturally that are God aspects. You know what I mean? Like who God is, is found in, in, in all of who we are, not in just one person. Yeah. And then, you know, so I think if we're doing that and if we're, you know, working in justice in a just manner, uh, that's, that's important. Uh, because, you know, now justice is on a lot of people's minds, but I think it's yeah. not on very many people's minds to do it in a just way. Um, so not being vengeful, not being vindictive, but really the, living out that kingdom ethic of, yes, this person's an heir, but I'm, I'm bringing light to them, uh, not fire, you know, and, uh, yeah. And, and you know what? There's evil people and they do evil things. And that's why God's kingdom is going to judge and take care of them. That's not my job to do that. At, at this moment in time, our job is to be ambassadors. And, and God will take care of those things himself. So we can leave vengeance to the Lord. And we can focus on being, you know, ambassadors of redemption. But I mean, I think it can, it, if we choose to, it'll be better. And if we choose to keep doing things the way we've done it then it'll just be about the same it's not going to get better just because time passes i i, I gotta want to make that point yeah. because sometimes people have that perspective it's just going to get keep getting better um i mean 80 80 percent of churches in this country are homogeneous or i think it's like 85 percent of churches in this country are homogeneous and and the the multi-ethnic ones that just means 20 percent of the congregation or more is of a different ethnic group so for the most part, our churches are completely homogeneous and segregated. Uh, so we have a long way to go before we feel really like we can pat ourselves on the back and say we're done. Now. Thank you for listening to the Small Group Leader Podcast. Our goal is to equip and encourage you as you go out and make disciples who make disciples.